Welcome everyone to our live stream on this Friday the 13th. Now, you know, some people say Friday the 13th is a very unlucky day. It isn't for me, in part because my daughter was born on a Friday the 13th. So I've always said it was a very, very lucky day in our household. Anyway, Friday the 13th, uh, we certainly have a lot to talk about today. The war in Israel, that is uh, just an awful, awful situation. We'll get into analyzing some of that. We have a lot of videos to kind of catch you up on what's been going on this week because quite frankly, the news from Israel has dominated to the point you may not think that anything else happened. Well, it did, we'll catch you up on it. And uh, we'll be taking questions that you will be sending to us. As always, Pam Case is with me today. She'll be uh, fielding the questions that you have. We hope that you will send them in the chat and for more visibility on your questions, send it in the super chat. Moderators are standing by. They watch the chat for your questions. They feed them to us. We get to as many as we can. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing my thoughts on the war in Israel and some of the response that we're seeing here in America. Senator John Fetterman makes a bombshell admission about himself and his fellow Democrats. I don't think he intended to. And we'll look at some of America's best and brightest politicians. We like to begin our weekly live stream with a pre-show poll. For those of you that have been here early, we let you kind of uh, give us your thoughts. So, Pam, what's our pre-show poll today? Well, first of all, I just have to say kudos to everybody sitting in queue today waiting for the poll. We have, uh, gosh, between eight and 900 participating nice. just in the pre-show poll. Here's the question. Which best, best describes American politicians? Hmm. Uh, dim, <laughs> corrupt, clowns, or for the people? Um, There's not a, all of the above. Uh, <laughs> or three of the four. Yeah, three, three out of four. Three of the four ain't four. bad. Huh. Um, clowns. Clowns. Clowns, all right. Say? 14%, ah. actually. Um, believe it or not. 78% say corrupt mm. uh, out of this group of 841 that voted today. Dim with 7% and for the people, uh, a lowly 1% today. 1%. So yeah, I'm surprised at that. One, of, one of you well-intentioned <laughs> souls out there still believe in Congress. <laughs> when they always say, you know, what's Congress approval rating is like 9%. Cockroaches and spiders have a better approval rating. And you always wonder, who's the 9%? Yeah. Who's the 9% say they're doing a great job. So today we have 1%. Yes. We appreciate your participation in the pre-show poll. Our top comment from last week, actually, was it last week? Did we do live stream last yes, week? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. It's been a long week. It's been a long a week. Very, it very has. long week. Feels like two weeks ago. Anyway, this comes from Carlos Lubala, who said, quote, Trump is the only candidate who can restore respect and dignity to the U.S. people and the world, period. Mm -hmm. Carlos, thank you for your view. You are awarded our comment of the week. Now, what is your prize? You were awarded our comment of the week. Yes. That's it, recognition. But what better gift could we give you than that yes. recognition? Yes, a nod. Yeah. <laughs> Here is my question for you this week. Our question of the week, we'd love to get your feedback on this. Should the names of Harvard students supporting Hamas be made known? What do you think? Should we reveal the names of those students that are supporting Hamas, these Harvard elite students? educated kids. Leave your answers in the chat or the comments section below. It's interesting because some of the uh, top CEOs in the country and major donors to Harvard are saying, I want to know who these kids' names are. I want to know because I want to make sure they're on a list and they never get hired. Never. Not by my company. I find that refreshing for a change. Yes. These CEOs have been bowing down to political correctness, but when they came out and basically said, yeah, we support the people that chopped off the heads of babies, that burned grandmas alive in their wheelchairs, mm. and that burned babies to a char in front of their parents, and that slaughtered a bunch of teenagers at an all-night party and just shot them uh, like you were shooting doves on opening day of season. Um, yeah, if you support that, I don't ever want you working for my company. God bless you for finally standing up and showing some sense of responsibility and decency and recognizing that you don't want someone like that working for you. And you say, well, these are just college kids. Well, this time they grow the stink up. Yes. Exactly. I, I'm happy. There was a, a donor couple. They were both on the Harvard Advisory Board for their foundation. $20 billion uh, couple. 
And they both resigned from the board and said not another dime to Harvard. That's when this stuff stops, yeah. is when the uh, donors start saying, no more checks, you're not getting another penny of us. Yes. Well, there's something I'd like from you, and it's not even money. It's subscription. That's right, subscribe to the channel. If you'll do that, you will make my day. And if you hit the notification bell, you'll make my day twice. And if you like and share this video, you'll really make my day. So that's, that's a simple request. And all you gotta do is touch a few things on your screen and bang, you've made my day. Just like Clint Eastwood said, go ahead, punk, make my day. That's all it took. And nobody gets hurt. Um, we wanna to begin today, there was really a video that's kind of resurfaced. It sounds prophetic now, Donald Trump, uh, I think this is probably three or four years ago when he made this speech, talking about Iran, watch. The Iranian government masks a corrupt dictatorship behind the false guise of a democracy. It has turned a wealthy country with a rich history and culture into an economically depleted rogue state whose chief exports are violence, bloodshed, and chaos. The longest suffering victims of Iran's leaders are in fact its own people. Wow, we think that was 2017, I'm not sure. Now, make sure you understand the setting. This was at the United Nations. This is Donald Trump, then president of the United States. Normally a speaker goes and they try to be polite and you know, uh, fair haired and happy and compliment everyone for their commitment to global peace. Donald Trump basically went in there and just scanned the absolute flesh off of the Iranian delegation. And the guy that's sitting there, I don't know if you could see his name plate, mm -hmm. he was the uh, UN ambassador from Iran. And he's sitting there and say what you want to about Trump, but fearless mm -hmm. is his name. And he goes into this arena where they hated him. They hated him and he didn't care. And he didn't go in there and try to be nice and make friends and be loved. He went in there and basically said, these are a bunch of bloodthirsty thugs. He was right. And we've seen it all the more yeah. this week. It's just been something. But anyway, fascinating thing. Uh, you can't open this live stream without talking about what's happened. It all happened since we were here last Friday. We had taped our show Friday night, Saturday morning. Uh, we all woke up to this news that Israel was being just hammered by rockets. And then as the day wore on, we got more information that it wasn't just the rockets, that a large contingent, several thousand um, Hamas members had left Gaza, broken into Israel, and were indiscriminately murdering and massacring uh, Israeli civilians. What made this so disgusting was that this was not an attempt to go up against Israel's infrastructure, take down a military base, go after their electrical grid, do great harm to their structure and their society. They specifically went into this raid to kill civilians, totally innocent people. Um, raping women viciously, violently, um, murdering 260 kids, most of them teenagers or early 20s, who had been at this dance party out in the desert all night. And, you know, they were just out there, you know, having a good time. And the uh, Hamas soldiers started coming in on paragliders and motorcycles. and intentionally going to as many as they could and just murdering them in cold blood. The whole thing is its just, it's so hard to get your arms around because really what the Jewish people have wanted since the Holocaust was just a, a place where they could be safe and secure. And they have fought to the death for this little bitty piece of land that they have of Israel, their indigenous homeland, since the time it was given to them by way of Abraham. And that's all they've asked for. Um, I get really angry when I hear Americans say, yeah, well, we've given, you know, we've always fought their wars. Not one set of American boots has ever been on Israeli soil fighting Israel's wars. Never. 
they buy $4 billion worth of hardware from us every year. Um, they'll be buying more this year. We have given them some things, but we give them less than we do most other countries. Now, I want you to put $4 billion that Israel got against $120 billion that Ukraine has had this year. So, you know, when people act like, oh, we just do so much for Israel. Not sure that we do enough. It's the only friend we got in the entire Middle East that's a faithful friend of ours. But even if they weren't a faithful friend of ours and a strong ally, nobody mm -hmm. deserves what they've been through. Mm -hmm. Nobody. It's hit close to home. Most of you know I've been going to Israel for many years. My first trip there, I was a teenager. It was exactly to the year, 50 years ago, uh, 1973. In fact, just before, two months before the Yom Kippur War. And I've been going back since that time, probably over 100 times. I was just there in August. And over the years, over 50 years, I've made a lot of friends. I know a lot of people there. Um, I was telling Pam when we, before we started today's uh, live stream that one of our friends, uh, niece, was at first missing. They didn't know if she was kidnapped or killed, and then two days later, they, uh, her body was discovered. She was, in fact, killed. A lot of our other friends, they have their sons or daughters in the military uh, called up for duty. All we can do is pray that they will be safe. But it's, uh, it's a very difficult and challenging situation. We will have much more on that uh, situation this weekend on the Huckabee Show. Please watch it. One of our key guests is uh, Ambassador David Friedman, who was the U.S. Ambassador to Israel during the Trump administration and a uh, wonderful uh, individual, one of the key architects of the Abraham Accords, and we'll be talking with him. He is in Israel with his family, children, and grandchildren. They were all there for uh, Sukkot, which is last week, the end of it. Uh, Simkat uh, Torah was the end. That was the last day of the Sukkot. So anyway, um, just a, a terribly tragic, tragic week. Um, if you want to understand why the hostility is so intense, children within the Palestinian world are taught from an early age to hate Jews and to grow up believing that their greatest goal in life is to kill Jews. And if you don't think that I'm serious about this. I want you to watch this. These are children in a Palestinian school. في ناس بدو بحب فلسطين بدهم يحاربوا وبدهم دمهم عشان عشان فلسطين. أنا بدي أهزمهم بالحرب. بدي أهزمهم. بعلمونا إن الأقصى إلنا وإلنا يعني الح يعني إلنا فلسطين والأراضي كلها إلنا لأنه لأنهم ب ب بسبب كذبهم وانتهاكاتهم إنهم يقولون إن إن الهيكل تحت المسجد الأقصى ولا مرة إنه يكون الهيكل تحت المسجد الأقصى. أنا أقرأ اليهود. Mm. You know, it's hard to watch this. These are little kids, look, what, seven, eight years old? Yeah. You know, it, it makes me think that we, we talk in this country about the mutilation of children's bodies and this transgender nonsense. This is a mutilation of these kids' minds. Yes. And, and their brains are being manipulated and, and mutilated. Um, you know, if you're a Palestinian and you kill a Jew, a street is named after you in the Palestinian Authority and sometimes a school, and your family gets a pension for life because you're a hero, you've killed a Jew. I mean, we just don't think in those terms. Israelis don't think in those terms. They don't get awards for killing a Palestinian. It doesn't work like that for them. Um, there are Palestinian sympathizers, even in our U.S. Congress, the so-called squad, a bunch of idiots, and maybe one of the chief idiots among them is Rashida Tlaib of Michigan, and somebody chasing her down the hallway just to ask, what do you think about... Uh, you know, the Palestinians chopping the heads off of babies. And you can see Rashida Tlaib, who, by the way, is flying a Palestinian flag outside of her U.S. congressional office, will have none of the question because she didn't want to have to answer it. Terrorists have um, cut off babies' heads and burned children alive. Do you support Israel's rights to defend themselves against this brutality? We're just going to go through here. You can't comment about Hamas terrorists chopping off babies' heads? Congressman, why do you have the Palestinian flag outside your office if you do not condone what Hamas terrorists have done to Israel? Do Israeli lives not matter to you? 
I think what makes that so very disgusting is how vocal she is when she gets in front of a microphone and can boast about her Palestinian roots and how apartheid Israel is. But in the face of this, she didn't want to talk. I guess I wouldn't either. A few weeks ago, Jake Sullivan, national security advisor for the Biden administration, made some remarks that, well, to say it didn't age well, I'll let you be the judge. And what we said is we want to depressurize, de-escalate, and ultimately integrate the Middle East region. The war in Yemen is in its 19 month of truce. For now, the Iranian attacks against U.S. forces have stopped. Our presence in Iraq is stable. I emphasize for now because all of that can change. And the Middle East region is quieter today than it has been in two decades. Hmm, not really. No, the quietest it was, you know, and, and again, I'm saying this full disclosure, you know, I'm a Trump supporter, but the quietest we've had was during the four years of Trump because the Middle East countries were scared of what he would do. And they're not afraid of what Biden would do. To be fair, I am very proud of the comments that Joe Biden has made and that his Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has made and that the Department of Defense Secretary, um, Lloyd Austin, has made. All of them have not put a uh, bit of daylight between the U.S. and Israel in their support. And I'm very grateful for that. It has been a full-throated support for the Israelis, and I pray that it stays that way even when Israel does, as they will, get into a heavy ground action in Gaza. There will be civilian casualties, and it's horrible, and I, I hate that it's going to happen. There's no way around it. Um, but just to, to put this in perspective, the Israelis have dropped hundreds of thousands of leaflets all over Gaza telling them, get out, get to the southern part of Gaza. We're going to take action in the north. They took over the television station. Israel has the technical capability to do that. And they've been broadcasting on Gaza television, telling everyone, get out. They have uh, hit every cell phone in Gaza. They've done everything they can to say, we don't want to hurt you, get out of the way. And uh, at this point, what else can they do? I guarantee you Hamas did not give Israel any warning and say, we're gonna come in and rape your women and murder your babies. So you might wanna think about being somewhere else next Saturday. Mm. Just a horrible, horrible thing. Um, I wanna get to this one other section and we'll take some questions and get back to our videos. but. This is too good not to uh, not to bring to you. John Fetterman was on Stephen Colbert this week, and I, I guess he has no sense of self-awareness, but this clip speaks for itself in a way that it's, it's honestly the funniest thing that's been on Colbert in probably several years. Colbert used to be funny. He isn't anymore. This was funny. You all should need to know that America is not sending their best and brightest, you know, to Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes sometimes you literally just can't believe like you know these people are making the decisions that are you know determining the the government here it's 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 actually scary yeah it sure is scary that john fetterman who dresses like a junior high gamer living in his mother's basement eating a bag of cheetos that he's the guy that's talking about how we don't send our best and brightest. And I'm thinking, we've never sent anyone less bright, less best than John Fetterman. I mean, he is a world unto himself, wearing these hoodies and shorts on the Senate floor for the week that they thought it was okay until even the Democrats said, makes us look stupid. And they went back to a dress code. That was hilarious. Yeah. That's some good comedy right there. Absolutely. You have to show up on all the night show on the on the uh, late night shows. Yeah, unintentional yes. comedy. It's beautiful. I thought so. Okay, let's take some questions. All right, uh, here's a comment from Lionheart Roar, a super chat, by the way. So thank you for that. Uh, why isn't Hillary arrested after the evidence of her paying for the dossier, Benghazi, lawlessness associated with her improper handling of official email and destruction evidence? The simple reason is because the Justice Department is basically being run by people who would never, ever touch someone on the left. Okay, simple enough. Um, all right, uh, obviously referring to Israel Rock Stop 22, how can anyone, anyone condone 
those barbarians? I don't think anyone can. I think the reason that some do is because I think it's a spiritual issue. I, I'll just be honest. I, I don't think you can, you, you can look at what's happened and somehow turn a, a blind eye to that unless you have a conscience that like it says in the New Testament, Romans chapter one, your conscience has been seared. Mm. And what that means is it's been scarred over because anything that you do over and over gets scarred. Right. And I think people have lived in rebellion against God and in sin so long that they've, their, their soul is scarred and it's been seared. And so they can look at this and somehow find a way to justify it. I don't think there's any political answer to that. I don't think it's military or economic. It's got to be spiritual. People are just that blind. I love this question from Carol Webb. Gov. How can we better educate our college students about Israel? And I think not just our college students. Yeah. I'm thinking, how do we at a young age here educate our children about Israel? First of all, don't let them go to an Ivy League school like Harvard or Yale or Princeton because they're such hotbeds of the far left that it, it just honestly is sending your kid um, to La La Land. You know, why would you spend the kind of money that it would cost for your kid to go there and your kid would come home unrecognizable and for the rest of your life, every Thanksgiving and every holiday meal would be a nightmare trying mm -hmm. to explain to your child um, that no, you, you can't go around and demand that the government um, open the borders and support Hamas and punish Israel. I mean, there are just so many things. So find a good community college, find a place that still has its sanity, a private Christian school, but don't let private Christian fool you because there's some of those that have gone woke and I wouldn't send my two dogs to it. Um, but take education back in your own hands. Every mother and father in this country must do that and keep looking, homeschool if you have to, but don't turn your children over to the forces of, basically I would say to the forces of hell itself because that's what you might be doing. All right, a shift in topic. I'm going to combine two, if that's okay with you, sir. Uh, Carol Webb says, can we get a speaker in the house soon? <laughs> now, uh, David Ferris, I'm combining these, uh, a super chat says, I nominate Mike Huckabee for speaker in the house. <laughs> so uh, you can respond to those <laughs> together if you like. Well, <laughs> David, thank you for your confidence. The answer is not no, but it's no. <laughs> no, thank you. Technically, you don't have to be a member of the house to be the speaker, but um, I wouldn't jump in the middle of that cesspool. Here's what I would love to ask, you know, and I know a lot of people were angry with me because I made the comment that those eight House Republicans that joined with the Democrats to kick Kevin McCarthy out, you want to ask them, how'd that, how'd that work out for you? In the language of Dr. Phil, how'd that work out for you? Not real well. It's been a disaster. And now they can't settle on anyone else either. Not well, now Steve Scalise. Scalise is out now. Yeah, so. he's taken himself out. Uh, Jordan may or may not get enough votes. And so, you know, in the meantime, we don't have enough uh, votes to get a speaker. Therefore, we don't have any business going on to the House. We can't help Israel. We can't do anything. Mm. We're just at a standstill. It's very, very unfortunate. Um, okay, I want to go to this uh, next section on the economy. We're going to get to it pretty quickly here. Um, I don't think I have to tell most people who are living paycheck to paycheck, but Bidenomics isn't working real well. Somehow that message hadn't gotten across to Corrine Jean-Pierre at the White House. Expected 3.7% year over year, unchanged from the prior month. You talk about all the spending last year to lower costs. Um, you know, the last couple of months, how is that lowering costs? So uh, look, what we believe is that buy Bionomics is an action, right? You're talking about lowering costs, right? And that's something that the president is certainly continuing to do. And yep. Yeah, that light bulb goes off again, I guess, because the best and the brightest, they're not in Washington and they're not <laughs> at the podium of the White House right now. Um, I'm going to skip over this next one because I want to get into some other stuff. So there was another piece there by Corrine Jean-Pierre on the economy, but I mean, it's, it's just the same kind of thing where she's trying to defend Bidenomics. I don't know how. Kamala Harris continues to uh, really impress us with her extraordinary command, not only of the great issues of the day, but her command of the English language. Um, 
If you've seen any of her speeches, you know she's big on the Venn diagram. And she's been talking about this for the last two years. I don't know if she even understands what it is. Watch. So here's, here's I think, at this point, a well-known secret about me. I, I love Venn diagrams. I love Venn diagrams. <laughs> and whenever I am presented with kind of like, this is complicated, I'm, I always wonder, is there a Venn diagram to figure this stuff out? And we love that about you. Right? No, we don't. We don't love it about her because it doesn't make sense. It makes no sense at all. And in fact, she never makes much sense. This was another instance of that very thing. Don't hear no. I eat no for breakfast. Don't hear no. <laughs> Always believe in what can be, unburdened by what has been. That phrase, she's used it several hundred times over the past two years. Believe in what can be unburdened by what has been. Did she make that up? I don't know. I'm still trying to unpack don't hear no. But <laughs> well, she eats it for breakfast. That's why you can't unpack it, because she's already consumed it. <sighs> That's you. what she had for breakfast. It, it must be locale. I don't know. Maybe it's a paleo. I'm, I'm not sure, but that's what she had for breakfast. What'd you have for breakfast, Madam Vice President? I ate no for breakfast. Mm -mm. Oh my gosh. Okay. What some, else we got? Some questions. All right. Um, Liz Bodica says, what was left behind in Afghanistan? Where's all that stuff now? There are reports, unconfirmed, but some reports that some of the equipment and uniforms and things that were left in Afghanistan were seen on Hamas soldiers mm. this past week. If that's true, then one more great, big, black eye, embarrassing moment for U.S. All right. So another question from Trudy Selzer. When are you going to invite President Trump to your show? And do you think that he should be Speaker of the House? Oh, it would be entertaining like crazy if he were Speaker of the House. I have invited him. I'm trying to work on a date. What we may try to pull off is a hour-long town hall here in our theater. Uh, with an audience that would ask him questions. So that's what we're working on. So it's not that we haven't, but getting a date that lines up for him to come here is really the key. I could easily go and do an interview with him sitting down, but because we do our show in front of a live audience, we like our guests to come here. The big exception we've had over the last year or so, two years, is David Friedman tonight, but it wasn't exactly easy for him to leave Tel Aviv, fly here for an interview and go back. So his interview, we did by remote, but normally we do not. Uh, so keep watching. We hope to provide you an answer to that soon. Another question, I will never understand why people who are Americans and live in America don't want to support America. As messed up as our country seems to be, God is still in control. Yeah, I've never understood that. You know, every time an election doesn't go the way of the left, they'll always say, okay, we're leaving. We're going to just pack up and go. And they still stay. And I wish they would go ahead and get it over with and leave. Uh, I think most of us would be more than willing to contribute to a fund to buy them one-way air tickets to the country of their choice. But, you know, it's like Rosie O'Donnell is going to leave and Sean Penn is going to move away and um, uh, trying to think some of these, uh, Joy Behar, they're all going to move. And they never do. They stick around, and we're the worse off for it. So if you hate this country, get the heck out of here. It's simple as that. You know, why stay in a place that you don't like? Especially these people that have a lot of money. And it'd be different if they were too broke to buy uh, an airplane ticket or get a ride on a boat or somewhere. But these are not. These are people of multimillionaires. They can live anywhere they want. And so if they're going to run the country down like they do, um, you know, bye-bye. And as my... Teen, uh, teenage pastor used to say, not he was a teenager, I was a teenager. Um, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Yes, I've used that a couple of times. Thanks <laughs> to you. Uh, okay. Purple Haze is asking if Trump can claim presidential immunity, can Biden for all the suffering and horrible policies and betrayal that he has put us through? Good question. Um, I mean, it's not really an immunity question because bad policy is not criminal. It's just bad policy. So unless he is proven to have taken bribes, which that could happen, uh, proven to have sold out the U.S. government for his own enrichment, and that's possible, those are criminal things. But bad policy, they're not criminal. It was just dumb that people voted for him. 
and that's how we can leave it. Speaking of dumb, there's nothing dumber than the way that our border is being treated by some of the politicians, especially those who once told us how terrific it would be if we had sanctuary cities and they declared their cities and their states sanctuaries and now they're not so sure. Governor Pritzker of Illinois being our first example today. The Democratic conventions in Chicago next year, are you confident that your city and your state are gonna have a better grasp on it by this time? I am confident that we can handle it, but again, it will require help from the federal government and someone needs to work in Texas with these border politicians to have them stop sending people only to blue cities and blue states. And the president of the United States and the White House has the ability to help disperse folks across the country. That will help a lot. Yeah, it's all the fault of those guys down in Texas. By golly, that's, that's where we need to throw the blame because they've only had hundreds and hundreds of thousands and Pritzker gets a few thousand and he can't handle it. But it wasn't the governors and the mayors in Texas who said, we're sanctuary cities, we're sanctuary state. They said, no, we want to close the border. We want to control what's happening to us. It was Pritzker and the people in Illinois, the mayor of Chicago, that declared sanctuary. But they didn't think there would ever be anyone coming there. And when a few thousand did, now they're screaming, oh, we can't handle it. It's those Texans' faults. Forget it. Eric um, um, Adams in New York, same thing. He's been a little bit more bold about blaming the Biden White House for letting it happen. But he understands New York City, biggest city in America, they can't handle it either. We can't have a rule that one can come from anywhere on the globe and come to New York City and remain in New York City as long as they want and taxpayers must pick up the cost. This is a $5 billion price tag uh, this fiscal year, $12 billion over three years. That money is coming from somewhere. It's mm -hmm. unfair to the migrant seekers and asylum seekers, and it's also unfair to everyday taxpayers, New, York, New Yorkers. Yeah, unfair to the taxpayers in New York. It's unfair to the taxpayers everywhere. The whole country's been uh, paying for this. It's nuts. And, uh, you know, he's getting close. That's why his light bulb flickered yeah, there flicker for a long time. Yeah, I see that. Quite a bit, because he was <laughs> almost at the place of just saying, open borders are stupid. That's the blunt way he needs to say it. I've got one other video, and then we're going to close out uh, for the day. But this is... Dylan Mulvaney, you remember the guy that uh, helped create the Bud Light controversy? He's a biological man. He pretends that he's a woman, says he's a woman. This is insane. Pam, he got named Woman of the Year by a Virgin Atlantic Airlines event. Watch this. Woman of the Year award, supported by Virgin Atlantic, goes to Dylan Mulvaney. <laughs> I am so honored to be here with you all tonight. And, you know, some see me as the woman of the year. Some see me as a woman of a year and some change, as I only publicly came out online 560 days ago. And some people don't see me as a woman at all. Yeah, we don't see you as a woman at all. And, and by the way, that was a candle next to her because she didn't even priceless. deserve a light bulb. That is priceless. And the candle was never lit. Yeah. Because she's not fully lit. Him. Him. Yeah. Did I say her? I think you did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure we're on the same page, Gov. <sighs> <laughs> You'll be uh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but I just find that totally repulsive. I really do. Yeah. You know, and uh, this whole pretense of he's a she, she's a he, whatever, it, it, it makes no sense to me. Well, if you haven't sent your questions or your thoughts, you can do it even after we finish our live stream. Um, send them to the chat. We'll take a look at them even after we're off the air. Have you subscribed yet? Because if not, I'm getting a little impatient with you right now. Is not like the time to do it? Just kidding, not that impatient. But go ahead and subscribe. It doesn't cost anything, and it doesn't put you on a list where you get hit up for anything. It just lets us tell you when we're going to be doing a live stream. That's simple. Hit the like button. Be sure to click the notification bell. 